Hello everybody and welcome back to the damage report. It is a big day for reasons that are probably abundantly clear. And so, you know what? I'm glad to be joined today in studio by Brett Erlich. Hi everyone, How's nice to see you. I'm layered up for the nuclear winter. Oh my God. Um, well, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, bring in your funnies. I'll tell you what, man. Uh, you know who else is gonna come and bring some funnies? Oh yes, I'm excited. Francesca Fiorentini is gonna be in the studio a little bit later to talk about her new special just aired last weekend, Red, White and Who, a dive into healthcare on MSNBC. I'm gonna say unlike any dive into healthcare on MSNBC up until this point. So uh, she's gonna be here to talk about that. She got to hang out and eat lunch with Bernie Sanders. Which is- Pretty amazing. Listen, as a, as a Jewish man, mm -hmm. That's Once you reach a certain age, well, Jewish men order the best in mm -hmm. terms of lunch, but watching them eat <laughs> is not a okay. gift. It's not a prize to be okay. won. Okay, well, you know what is a gift? The time we have, which Cold is quickly slot. running Everybody. out. And so with That's that, why don't we jump right into it? There's a lot coming, there's your preview. Okay, let's do it. Donald Trump is running for reelection on promises made, promises kept. We've got one for that file, here's one of his promises. Our president will start a war with Iran because he has absolutely no ability to negotiate. He's weak and he's ineffective. So the only way he figures that he's going to get reelected and as sure as you're sitting there is to start a war with Iran. Now, I will say even after all this time, I'm not used to the speaking in the third person. I I'm kidding, it. of course he's talking about Obama there, as you probably know at this point. But there he is doing what he does, which is just, he opens his jaw and projection comes out. Yeah. Like Cyclops' eyes, he can't help it, it just emits. I mean, projection. You weren't expecting an X-Men reference, were you? Okay. No, good for you. Okay, thank you. Um, but no, that's that's it. It's very difficult. This is a, it's an ink blot of, of which of Trump's very obvious um, problems is the actual reason for him doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, the very transparent things like one, uh, is it the tweets that he mentioned over and over again, that statement where he's saying back before when when Obama was president, the, you know, Obama's gonna invade, invade to get reelected. It's very obvious that he does a lot of things to get reelected. Mm -hmm. This is one of those, this could be read as yeah. one of those things. There's a bunch of other reasons as well, but um, none of them seem to be what we're hearing from the White House. Exactly, and, by, and so I got more on this, but like, take a look at that. They're like, they were like, he's gonna do it. Obama's gonna, he's gonna attack Iran to get reelected. And what did Obama do? He got a deal with Iran. So then Trump comes in, shreds the deal, and then attacks Iran, and they're all saying. Not only do we support this, but this is the pro peace move. Obama, even now in hindsight, he was the pro war one. That's what Ben Shapiro's show was this morning. It's and Trump is the pro peace one. And by the way, Trump when we talk the about the projection, one. it would be bad enough if it was that one video. That yeah. would be weird and way too specific, but it wasn't. Take a look at this, it was put together by his swarthy bastard on Twitter. That's not all of them, but every one of those tweets is how Barack Obama is going to, before the election, attack Iran. Sometimes it could be Libya, but generally it's Iran uh, to get reelected. Over and over and over again, he said it. Over the course of more than a year or two, he was saying it. And then for those listening to the podcast, that's eight tweets of yes, Trump basically you. saying the same thing over again. In order items. to get elected, Obama will start a war with Iran. Barack Obama will attack in the not too distant future because it will help him with the election if the any goes on. But there's and let, don't let Obama play the Iran card in order to start a war in order to get reelected. Be careful, Republicans. It's yes, January. Be careful. It's like, let me start an election year off right. He didn't kill Soleimani on the day after the, his New Year's Eve party because he was just like recovering. Mm -hmm. But the next day, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of different angles on this that we're going to talk about. Yeah. Um, but the frustration that, like, it's one, it's one thing for us to show you the video and the tweets now, but like last year, six months ago, and we're gonna refer to that, when he was like on the brink with Iran, we were talking then about how hot he was to start a conflict that he knows is gonna get Republicans to back him up even more. It's just so frustrating. Um, there's so many things that the American uh, foreign policy apparatus does not understand that other people, that's how they operate. Mm -hmm. like, when you think through Soleimani's job, Soleimani's job was basically to, among other things, keep attacking American interests, weaken Iraq, make it so that in a weakened state that Iran is in, it can have some kind of strategic advantage. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. But like, 
I don't know. I, it comes down to me. There's one possibility of the reason that Trump has done this to Soleimani is back in 2018 when Trump wanted to talk to President Rouhani. Instead, he heard back from uh, Soleimani saying, it is beneath the dignity of our president to respond to you. I, as a soldier, respond to you. We are near you. We're where you can't even imagine. We are ready. We are the man of this arena. He said that to yeah. Trump. And I'm sure that's stuck in Trump's Trump's craw for a while. But Probably. like. It's just, it's just wildly irresponsible, ridiculous. This is not a game. In the wake of this, he just tweets an American flag. Yeah, so let's bring that up. That's this is seriousness, potentially launching us into this massive, maybe multi-decade conflict that's gonna cost trillions of dollars, God knows how many lives. He just puts up the flag. Because if you think that American society or American politicians or American media has learned or evolved in any way since 2001 and 2003, you're wrong. It is going to be the same thing over. Anyone today who is speaking in favor of peace, prepare to get Dixie chicked um, all over the place. It was on Fox News, Stuart Varney uh, like talking about how oh, it's gonna be really difficult politically to be against this in any way. It is gonna be so easy to be politically against General this. General Tata is like, well, I mean, Democrats jumping to side with Iran. It's this, and that's my my growing frustration with the general media apparatus is they pretend like they've done this a million times, but at the same time, like they've never done this before. Mm. The lower thirds on every media besides this one is essentially like, uh, he was foment, he was about to strike imminently, mm -hmm. and the which is not what the Department of Defense is saying. No, but it's what Pompeo is saying. It's what everybody else, uh, everyone is is repeating yeah. as the justification. They just have to put it up there because it's the line they got from somebody. Exactly. But it's the exact same lines we got before that didn't make any sense. Yeah. We didn't realize how much Iraq, as it was, benefited us geopolitically. Yeah. With with a strong man in charge. I'm sorry, that sucks to. Say Say, but that it was better because Iran was focused on Iraq, mm -hmm. it, and 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 the, another frustrating thing for me is Trump's Trump saying he's against war, no, and trying to get out of the Middle East, and he then launches this attack. How many which, news cycles were giving him credit for like ending the forever wars a month or two ago? But they aren't. This is going to send. By the way, as war. of this morning, we're sending 3,500 more troops there. Yeah, but the good thing about that is, so we took out this guy because he was going to attack us. It was a defensive retaliatory thing, and now it's done. That's it. No, nothing's going to happen now. They're not going to respond in any way, and we won't respond to their response. And we haven't. Hold on, really fast. We haven't done the incredibly convenient thing, which is you take thousands of American troops, you put them in a place where they're sure to be the target of violence, and then you use that violence to justify literally anything you want to do. Yeah. And then if your justification leads to more attacks, that itself is a justification for even more. That's how you're there for 20 plus years. But starts off by saying we're, we say we saved American lives by killing Soleimani. This is a guarantee but, of more violence. But the next, but everything they've said after in terms of evacuating people from the embassy, in terms of surging in the area, mm -hmm. is, a, is, a, is, a is a recognition and a, and a risk move placing people on the map. That you have escalated dangerousness. Yes, and, exactly. And, and it, they admit it. So they admit it. Their actions admit it. Well, at the same time, they it, and it's so frustrating, and it's incumbent on everyone in America to say this is not going to happen again. Yes. Well, we're trying. Okay, so uh, let's turn to another angle on this. There are not a lot of people in media that are going to be unambiguously against war today, but there is one. Weirdly, it's Geraldo who spoke on Fox and Friends in the immediate aftermath of something like this. Fox doesn't necessarily have their narrative ready. And so you get moments like this. This isn't about his resume of blood and death. It is about what was next. We stopped the next attack. It was preemptive. That's what I think you're missing. According to the Secretary of State. And so and we should by, allow the next by attack? What, by what? Credible source, okay. can you predict what the next Iranian right. move the would Secretary be? Secretary of State, State and State. American intelligence well, provided that material. Yeah, they've been excellent. They've been excellent. The US uh, intelligence has been excellent since 2003 when we invaded Iraq, disrupted the entire region for no real reason. Don't for a minute. Start cheering this on. What you have done, what we have done, we have unleashed. I will cheer it on. We have, all right, I will well, cheer you, it on. I then you, I like Lazy Graham, I'm, I'm have never it. made a war you didn't like. That, that is I, not true. If, and, and don't even say that. If, if President Trump wanted de escalation. We should just let him kill us for another. 
Yeah, so uh, it just, I wanna say implicit in the argument from kill me and kill me now um, is, is that uh, Suleimani being dead stops the Quds force. Nobody thinks that. No, it doesn't. Nobody thinks and that. And all Except it did for was News. guarantee an imminent threat of attack. Yeah. And the previous attack it was on an installation with like Iranian backed militia, sure, but like it were, and previous to that, it was on a, a, a an American um, contractor was killed. Mm -hmm. And like, what is that person doing there? Yeah. So here is here is the analogy and then we because everybody the head of the Quds force. Everybody wants to stop our troops from being killed. We just disagree on how to do it. So effectively, what we've done is we've taken an American soldier, we've put him on train tracks, and we've laid him there. And now, anytime a train comes along, we have to blow it up. And that's the only solution. You can't take the person off the train tracks and out of danger. You have to blow up anything that comes near them. That's literally the argument he's making there. We had to do this thing, which is almost certainly gonna lead to more violence to stop our soldiers from being attacked, even though doing it increases the chance that they get attacked, not to rather than taking them out. And if you say it's a stupid analogy, because why is he on the train tracks? I have the same question for you with Iraq. No one on that panel, you had three people, you didn't have three brain cells. Nobody on that panel can argue why we're in Iraq still. Except as a convenient justification for military action in the future. Yeah. Hold uh, on, there's a little bit more. Why don't okay. we play the last video and then we'll respond? If 15 President years. Trump wanted de escalation and to bring our troops home, what this was a reaction to. What about to the 700 Americans that are dead? Should they not be happy? You know, because of him? What about, what about the tens of thousands of Iraqis who have died since 2003? You have to start seeing things. What, okay. what the hell are we doing in Baghdad in the first place? So you why, are, why are we you, there? You, you're blaming, why aren't these you're forces blaming on? President Bush for the maniacal. I am blaming President of Bush. I am blaming President Bush in 2003 for those fake weapons of mass destruction right. he, that never existed oh and the con job Geraldo, that drove us into that war. Geraldo, uh, I think there's a disagreement here at the desk on uh, all of that. Yeah. Hey, here's uh, Geraldo is not great, Geraldo but he's right. He has flashes. He has flashes of cage. Sometimes he's just he's the worst. But that somewhere Chef right. Smith's fingernails are worn to the bone, <laughs> scratching at the walls. Mm -hmm. Like, let me back out there to be that kind of countervailing force. This is a lot of what Trump has done in this action has. I mean, it, there's a saying that America, American military, no better friend, no worst enemy. Mm -hmm. I would update that to no worst enemy, no worst friend. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be there to help the Iraqis. The Iraqi president came out and was like, I cannot condone this. This yeah. was this action was an explicit violation of the terms in, under which we're there, and not to mention the reason we went in the first place. Mm -hmm. And now is an opportunity for everyone in the uh, Democratic Party, the Republican Party, to do right by what they did wrong to get us into Iraq in the first place. Yeah. They need to take this opportunity. The danger is they might just be such huge cowards that they'll do the same stupid crap again. Yes, and understand that again, because of the way corporations work, there are media companies that are owned by defense contractors effectively, whose stocks have gone up weirdly bro, enough in the past the, couple of days. So, bro. But like, yeah, <laughs> the this price of oil just went up. Yeah, and helps in the all meantime, these companies. We produce a lot more here, and uh, and yeah. so and so they. They just made a ton of money. Exactly, it's it's absolutely insane. And uh, so we'll, we'll see who the media has on. Um, I have a feeling it's gonna be the same exact people who are in, who were pushing for war with Iraq initially. The same people who during the 2016 election were saying, Trump, secretly the pro-peace guy, he's actually the dove. Oh God. Have any of those people come out and apologized? And I feel- Are you holding your breath for it? I also feel like a broken record because like the shape of Iraq, the name of Iraq, the existence of Iraq, is because oil in the first place. Mm -hmm. And if we were not dependent on that form of energy, the only like equivalent would be if Iran started building giant shades over the sun over America, <laughs> would be the only like equivalent to the Strait of Hormuz in a renewable energy environment. Exactly, we should work on that. Okay, uh, we're gonna take a break, back after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated 
by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Through the course of the last year, we have been joined by a number of reporters from the Center for Public Integrity that have broken down some fascinating and important topics involving campaign finance, including deep dives into the financing of virtually all of the candidates in the Democratic primary. Well, now 2019 is over, but we wanna look back at some of the big things that the Center for Public, Public Integrity found. And we're joined now once again by Sarah Kleiner, federal politics reporter. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, John, how are you? Um, uh, well, you know, not great, but glad to have you here though. <laughs> Thanks so much. So um, you've got this uh, new article that you co-authored with the Center for Public Integrity. And it basically points out a number of interesting statistics that popped up over the past year. What are some of the things that you'd like to focus on? Sure, so uh, we had a range of stories last year. We looked at the Federal Election Commission and the fact that it has basically been unable to enforce the nation's campaign finance laws. Uh, it has been without a quorum of commissioners now for four months. So uh, without a quorum, it can't convene. It has, the FEC has uh, basically canceled 11 out of 22 meetings in 2019. Um, and they have a backlog of investigations that are waiting, uh, waiting to be reviewed. And uh, no one is able to do that at this point. So some of those uh, cases are likely going to pass the statute of limitations meaning uh, justice will not be served in some cases. And uh, so I had sort of been hoping that by the time we talked again, because we've spoken about this earlier in the year, that there would be some sort of progress on that. Well, now we're entering into, we're in 2020. Every day we get a day closer to uh, the general election. And so um, if nothing improves between now and November 3rd at the FEC, I mean, I guess it's kind of obvious, but who benefits from the fact that the FEC can't do its job? Right. I mean, at this point, uh, it's it's widely known that that the FEC isn't able to do its job. It only has three of six commissioner slots filled, and those three people have actually exceeded their term limits. So, uh, yeah, politicians are very well aware that this is the case. And there's uh, whenever uh, no one's watching, there's always a chance. This is why reporters do their jobs because we like to keep an eye on things, but. Um, when there is no watchdog, when there is no agency that's that's looking out for uh, what's going on with campaign finance laws, um, there's always a chance that those laws might be broken and then nothing yeah. is done about it. You know, there was one stat in the article that stood out to us, and it was that one in five of the people who donated to a Democratic primary candidate donated to two or more candidates, which is it's not what I would have expected. Um, what what do you think that we can draw from from that statistic? Right. So. At that point, this was the first half of 2019. At that point, um, we were we had uh, well over a dozen candidates. We actually still have over a dozen candidates in the race. I think we're at 14 now um, in the Democratic race. And it, so uh, donors had many, many candidates to choose from. And we talked to some of those donors to find out why are they giving to multiple candidates? Um, for instance, we talked to one man out in California who had given to Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. He said he wanted to make uh, he, he wanted to basically use his money as a, a voice to say he was hoping the party would would nominate a more progressive candidate. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, so basically, uh, at that point, it, it was donors trying to influence the race, uh, it, you know, by giving to multiple candidates. And we're actually a month now away from the Iowa caucus, so uh, it's the pool is going to winnow down relatively quickly here. 
And I saw one stat was it was the number seven. It was the number of emails and I believe text messages that have gone unanswered by the Joe Biden campaign asking him to disclose his bundlers, which is something that Pete Buttigieg recently had to do after a lot of public pressure, including from some of his opponents in the Democratic primary. Joe Biden is actually still leading. Why do you think that he either hasn't released it yet or hasn't faced the same sort of public pressure campaign that Buttigieg did? Yeah, so it's uh, it, it's interesting. It, to be clear, the, the bundlers are uh, these are high uh, uh, highly influential people, uh, wealthy people who get their friends together and they write checks and present this nice uh, bundle of campaign contributions to candidates. Um, so we've seen a lot of talk in this election about small dollar donors and how uh, how candidates are really pushing for having multiple small dollar donors. And there's less, uh, it, it's not as trendy to have uh, big money in politics. So it's it's not something that the candidates necessarily want to talk about. Uh, and and I think we're seeing that with Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanna ask you a general question about that. Because uh, as I alluded to in the intro, um, uh, yourself and a couple of your uh, of other um, uh, contributors and authors for the Center for Public Integrity joined us over the last year to talk about campaign finance, uh, about individual candidates. And just over the past couple of months, we've had multiple sort of news cycles about Pete Buttigieg and wine caves and bundlers and all of this. Do you think that that we've reached sort of a new point that the amount of public attention to the way that candidates are financing themselves, is that different in some fundamental way than in past elections? Well, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think, I, think it is, uh, I think it is a little different this time around. And I think there's just this increased uh, energy uh, among the electorate uh, after Donald Trump's election. And I think that really changed a lot uh, about the way things are shaping up. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I wanna thank you both for joining us today throughout the last year and for your great work uh, shedding light on this really important topic. And anyone watching this, you should definitely go to the Center for Public Integrity. The article, it's at publicintegrity.org. The article is by the numbers, a 2019 Money and Politics Index, which uh, Sarah, as well as Dave Leventhal and Carrie Levine, um, all of whom have appear, appeared on the show, uh, co-authored um, a great roundup of some of the, the awesome work that you guys have done over the past year. Thanks so much. Thank you. We're gonna take a short break here. When we come back, more on the impending crisis with Iran after this. So we've talked a bit about the media analysis of the immediate aftermath of the airstrikes of yesterday and what's likely to happen between the US and Iran. But I wanna turn now to the Democratic contenders. Staking out a position on this seems pretty important because by the time we have a general election, we might well be in a war with Iran. And look, I'm biased, I know, but I wanna give credit to Bernie Sanders for at least right now, the best, most unambiguous statement about what is going on right now and what it represents. And we're gonna show you a few. Um, but I wanna read uh, the initial tweet that he put out. He said, when I voted against the war in Iraq in 2002, I feared it would lead to greater destabilization of the region. That fear unfortunately turned out to be true. The US has lost approximately 4,500 brave troops, tens of thousands have been wounded, and we've spent trillions. Trump's dangerous escalation brings us closer to another disastrous war in the Middle East that could cost countless lives and trillions more dollars. Trump promised to end endless wars, but this action puts us on the path to another one. And we were talking about that earlier, all the, the glowing praise from media figures about him wanting to end those endless wars. And now thousands more soldiers are going to Iraq. A little message to everyone running for president, if not now, but in the future. We will reward the people who are against war. Mm -hmm. Like the main determining factor between Barack Obama and everyone else on that stage, both of whom have have uh, were either the vice have lost bids for presidency in mm -hmm. their tenure, um, Hillary Clinton and uh, Joe Biden. The less bellicose person has won. Mm -hmm. The less perceived to be a war ready person won, including Trump over Hillary Clinton, because it was perceived, as he said it over and over again, you gotta get out of these wars. These wars are stupid. Get out of them, get out of them. And people had this perception of Hillary Clinton, you know, in many senses rightly founded, especially in relation to Trump, that she was the hawk. And America, that turned a lot of people off. Mm -hmm. And so now we. I'm thankful that in a way, not not for what happened, but at least the clarity it should give everyone that Trump is indeed a warmonger and a hawk. Mm -hmm. And he went after someone who, he, I mean, he, he, 
He did all this, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you stand up to that, history shows you will be rewarded with the presidency in the future. Yeah, and look, we do have, we have a number of different responses from candidates. So I'm gonna give you more from Bernie Sanders, but as a preview, so as you're seeing this, understand what we have seen, like none of the candidates that I've seen are like, let's get them, let's yeah. go to Iran. But all of them are like, well, you know, I just wanna say, like obviously he was a terrible person. He was. It's good for the book. Yeah, 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 that's fine, that's fine. And then like at the very end, it's like, I think Trump might have been a bit rash. And we should be consulted on future actions. That is not an unambiguous statement against war. Making clear the lives that we lost, I don't the think money you that we make unambiguous statements against war. What's that? I don't think you should make unambiguous statements okay. against the concept against this of war. war. I think yes. you should. If you aliens should. invade, we should fight back against the aliens. Yes, there are some wars that hypothetically we should be in favor of. The American people have not been presented with one of those for a very yeah. long time. Bernie Sanders was a young guy when the last. No, anyway. So here's a little bit more from Bernie Sanders. By the way, some histor history. Because this is not just like he's popping up and taking a look at how people think about this right now. Back in June of last year, he wrote an op-ed, we must stop the US from going to war with Iran. Yeah. That was back when Trump was on the brink the last time. And by the way, he got criticized for a appearance he made on the media in response to those strikes. Here's a bit of that, this is six months ago. Was President Trump's decision this week to call off that strike the right one? <laughs> See, it's like somebody setting a fire uh, to uh, a basket full of paper and then putting it out. Uh, he helped create the crisis and then he stopped the attacks. The idea that we're looking at a president of the United States who number one, thinks that a war with Iran is something that might be good for this country. He was just doing a limited strike. Oh, just a limited strike, Oh well, I'm sorry. I just didn't know that it's okay to simply attack another country with bombs, just a limited strike, that's an act of warfare. Yeah, that should this be the most obvious thing. But they, they, like we are, we are not exceptional in the way that some right wingers want you to think that America is exceptional. But one of the exceptional things about us is we can do anything we want and still be the bigger, better person. I mean, in the meantime, what Trump has done, I don't really know the exact timeline, but in the meantime, in, in order to get around this uh, argument against Trump that he is attacking just a general from a foreign country, he decided to label, and it was Israeli too, decided to label the Quds Force as a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. How convenient, now I have some kind of insulation, but like just look at the setup of Iran's government and you'll see that that is like that is just like a general in the army who handles things overseas or you know abroad. Yeah. That's his job, the head general that handles things abroad. Yeah, and in response is now doing another surge in Iraq. Uh, we are um, so and, okay. And like, okay, so we, 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 we have a lot that we have okay. to go to. So let's, right. let's be brief. You can say something. We have to be brief. He funds militias mm -hmm. to forward his. Uh, he funded militias to forward Iranian interests I I abroad, and mm -hmm. that's what we do. Yeah, All and, the time. and like yes, I understand. It's this stupid thing where it's like if you if you don't do ten paragraphs of well, of course he was a bad guy. You're perceived as un-American. There's a lot of bad guys. The the same justification that can be used to kill him. Why is Kim Jong Un still galloping across the plane on his white horse if we're just totally justified in taking out every bad guy? Why didn't we nuke him yesterday? Nuclear because weapons. What's that? Nuclear weapons. That's and a good lack point of too. Oil. Yes. Um, well, but I will say that you don't have to have five paragraphs as your argument, and then you're going to read a bunch of tweets. I'm not gonna read all of it, by the way, I'm all just right. gonna give you an idea. One other person who I think had a pretty good statement was Andrew Yang, who tweeted, war with Iran is the last thing we need, it is not the will of the American people. We should be acting to deescalate tensions and protect our people in the region. I've had my issues with him recently on Medicare for all, but that is a good, relatively unambiguous statement. Now, as an example of what we were talking about though, you have Elizabeth Warren, who says Soleimani was a murderer responsible for the deaths of thousands, including hundreds of Americans. But this reckless move escalates the situation with Iran and increases the likelihood of more deaths and new Middle East conflict, our priority must be to avoid another costly war. Uh, yeah, that, that's fine, I guess. Um, and you had, uh, I'm not even gonna read Buttigieg's because it was very long and I couldn't find the raw text, but it was another thing where it was like four paragraphs to get to the yeah. point of, uh, he really should have uh, talked with Congress and uh, seems a little bit reckless. This is the, the incumbent president that you wanna challenge launching totally unilaterally with no consultation that we know of with Congress or our allies launching potentially a war on the scale of Iraq. And you're like, he was a bit a bit brazen. Yeah. That's what you're saying at this point? Yeah, hashtag peak Buttigieg. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, Everything he does is like that. So I, I hope that the other candidates, Klobuchar's got a little tweet and Biden, it's all very similar to the Buttigieg stuff and the, the Warren stuff. And it's you know it's not it's not the worst compared to the Republicans, it sure looks good, but it also doesn't seem like someone who is going to do everything necessary to make sure this war doesn't happen. Now I want to briefly turn to something a little bit lighter, 
Uh, so let's let's turn now. Uh, the right wing was so happy when this strike happened yesterday. They were just so excited about it. And it started the same sort of online back and forth that you might expect. Now it involves uh, this person, uh, Emma Vigland, who got into it with uh, this guy. Um, uh, ben Shapiro. So Ben Shapiro had tweeted at her, uh, Soleimani was one of the leading terrorists on the planet, was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of Americans, was planning blah, blah, blah. Um, spot on comparison there, Sparky. I, is that like a 50s TV reference that he was tweeting at her? I honestly don't know, but it was weird. So she responded, Ben, you should do that singular push up you've been putting off for 30 years and enlist so you can fulfill your dream of killing Muslim civilians in person. <laughs> Which is just <laughs> devastating. And it's why I declared on Twitter that Emma Vigeland is the hero that we both need and deserve. She's a princess um, who's been promised. Because yeah, it's, it's all of these people like Ben, there's a million Ben Shapiros. And all of them are just, they're there to, to wave the pom poms for war. No, There's no serving, you had um, uh, uh, Eric Trump uh, said great job. Trump just took out the world's biggest bad guy. Well, yeah, he would know, I guess, since he served in the military. No way he didn't, none of the Trumps did, none, none of them. They all had bone spurs, but they're all hot for it now. All these Republicans who couldn't find it in themselves to serve, they don't care at all about the likely costs of this. And so yeah. I'm glad that anyway that she pointed it out. Great job, Emma. Yeah, uh, it's just, I don't know. I just want to point out that like before Trump came into office, we were in a peaceful treaty with Iran where they were not developing nuclear weapons and had no roadmap to get to it. And yep. we were going nowhere with North Korea. We're still going nowhere with North Korea. And fortunately, they have a sick reel of walking around with Donald Trump that they can air whenever the hell they want. Yeah. And then with Iran, they have said proudly, all right, y'all pulled out of my deal. Yeah. We are going to develop nuclear weapons. Yes. That is happening. And now Trump is killing the head of their foreign brigade. Yeah. And we are on the brink of war. Yeah. So good job, Sparky. <laughs> okay, we're going to end it there. We're going to take a short break. We come back. Francesca Fiorentini is going to be in the studio to talk about a recent special on MSNBC. After this. If you were lucky enough to watch MSNBC last Sunday around 6 p.m. Pacific time, you might have seen a deep dive in healthcare in America that certainly stood out from the normal way the mainstream media talks about it. And that special, Red, White, and Who, was brought to you by Francesca Fiorentini, who joins us now in studio. Hey, hey welcome back to the John, studio. Thanks for having me. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And a new war. Oh, oh it's yeah. so exciting. Um, um, yes, if you were here. happened to be on watching MSNBC, uh, or visiting your parents who have MSNBC mm -hmm. on December 29th, you caught Red, White, and Who? Well, look, I watched it with Arlene, my wife, and uh, we had a great time because, like, so, I mean, you're gonna talk about the special. I will just say my sort of spoiler for it is um, I was surprised that they ran it with the way you talked about Medicare for All and the, like, it, you don't often hear it on CNN and MSNBC. Right. Like, and it was great that because of you, many people who don't get exposed to this particular view on healthcare and what needs to happen, like they saw it. I think the main thing that well, that we don't see on mainstream media or or a lot of media generally is actually an explanation of our current system, mm -hmm. an explanation of Medicaid, Medicare, what are they for, who are they for? Um, the ACA, like has the ACA been fully implemented? Actually in 14 states where under the ACA, the Medicaid was supposed to be expanded, 14 states have not done that. So millions of people who should be getting accessible and free or almost free, very affordable healthcare under Medicaid, are not right now. Mm -hmm. So like there's all this misinformation and it is a dry topic. It is bureaucratic. I think it's you made confusing. it fun though. Thank you. And I think but that's the reason why I think a lot of folks are turning to Medicare for all is because it's like actually this simplifies things. Mm -hmm. um, and after understanding and seeing how folks that that I spoke to in three different states all in different um, sort of uh, all in different states, if you will, of healthcare, meaning national policies are playing out differently in their, in their, you know, where they're located. Um, you realize that we're all operating in the dark under different plans with, you know, um, with no way of, of really navigating it, actually. Yeah. It's confusing for people. Not only is it confusing, 
it's expensive, mm -hmm. um, and it's dysfunctional, right? Yeah, Folks? you have people who are like camped out, like semi permanently outside of hospitals uh, right. in Houston, I believe it was. Yes. Um, because it's just so expensive. So people have sold their homes, they're living in like campers basically. Right. And, um, and by the way, you didn't just go around talking to big lib activists and everything, like you were talking to cowboys and people in Texas and stuff like that. Yes, that's the first, that's the first stop was Texas, and I made sure uh, I was like, who's got the most dangerous job? And mm -hmm. yet, kind of the most American job, uh, mm -hmm. and that is a cowboy who doesn't have health insurance. Insurance. And I was like, uh, not insuring a cowboy, wouldn't you consider that a little un-American? And he was like, I, I don't know how to answer that. But so, so that's what I want to touch on next. So um, not all of them necessarily, you know, are like like super progressive, like on healthcare. But these people, like you're talking, they're in the middle of health crises of their own. Um, were there any sort of common elements to what they were looking for in the future, what they wanted to see proposed? What? Yeah, so that's sort of what I was saying is that even though it's it's not spelled out as Medicare for all, I think folks want simplification. Mm -hmm. And they know that they're being gouged either way. So a lot of the people that I spoke to, um, they're like, well, I don't think it should be free, you know, but literally these are my life savings. Mm -hmm. This is my entire retirement. And we are the lucky ones in this RV park because we have friends who weren't able to up and move to a different state to get the best care for cancer and those people are dead. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, it, it's terrifying and terrible. And, you know, even in places like New York um, where we ended up, which has like 5% uninsured, you know, folks. So it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, people have health care. I talked to a mom who her son got sick and basically she's now in favor of Medicare for all because between the hospitals and the doctors and the specialists, all who are on different forms and take different forms of insurance, like you're in network, you're out of network. Yeah. Um, she doesn't care who's in her, who's out of her network. She's trying to keep her son alive. Yeah. Meanwhile, her husband is afraid to lose his job because if he loses his job, they lose their specific health insurance. So she's like, this is way more complicated than it needs to be. It's a cruel system. Yeah. And so she's like, let's stra let's stra uh, scrap it, strap and scrap, uh, and, <laughs> and have something simpler. Mm. So that was the commonality, even if a lot of the folks I talked to weren't ready to say Medicare for all, they know that what's happening right now uh, is completely dysfunctional. Yeah. So um, the special aired, yes. as of right now, it's a one of, but it's not difficult to imagine how that could be a series. And so if people are interested in seeing more progressive program on MSNBC, what can they do to make that happen? I think you should at MSNBC. So tweet them. Tweet MSNBC, uh, read them on Facebook, say you want Red, White, and Who re-aired, you want more Tag episodes. Tag Francesca. Tag me, Franny, Fio. Also, um, uh, my full interview with Bernie Sanders, because we did end the entire special with a sit down over bagels with you know, the big man. Um, it, the Which full is interview. Awesome. I'm super jealous. It was, by it the was way. fun. It was fun. I bet. Uh, made him laugh twice. It was great. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, but watch the full interview. It's 11 minutes long. He goes in depth into Medicare for all in ways that I don't think we've seen him go in depth before, um, talking about how it's going to be implemented, how initially in the first year, it would go down to 55 rather than 65 for mm -hmm. Medicare, then 45. So there is actually a plan of implementation. He has thought this through, yeah. um, and that doesn't always get out because, well, there, there really is a media blackout, and I think we're starting to break yeah. that. And um, you can perhaps be a part of that, get that 11 minute interview, tweet that out at her at MSNBC and show them that there is a demand and appetite for this sort of content. Uh, Francesca, it was awesome, I really enjoyed it. And thank, thank you, you for joining us today, Thanks great so to have much, you here. John. Thanks so uh, Stick around, we got one more segment with Brett after this. One of the cool things about being a right winger, a personality, an influencer, whatever, is you can do any terrible thing. And as long as your name stays out there, there's always going to be a way to make money off of that. And so to explain one example of this, let's return to Chief Edward Gallagher. So he was acquitted this summer of charges that he shot at civilians and killed a wounded captive with a knife while serving as a platoon leader in Iraq. The punishment for his lone conviction posing for a grisly trophy photo with the dead captive's body was reversed this fall by President Trump, who has repeatedly praised him. Uh, he was at the Mar-a-Lago Christmas thing, he's gonna be all over the place on the right. Now he's modeling his own lifestyle clothing brand, endorsing nutrition supplements and positioning himself as a conservative influencer with close ties to a man who helped clear him, President Trump. And the thing is, 
he probably has those close ties. Because Donald Trump wants guys like that around him, yeah. guys who he only knows about because of the terrible things that they have done. Yes. And now there will be people who like, you know what, that, that guy that got away with killing civilians, I wanna wear his face on my shirt. It's disgusting, John. But this is all disgusting, and mm -hmm. this is the constant grift that mm -hmm. is the media, political media apparatus at this point. Um, and it, it is, I guess, kudos to Trump for recognizing the potential of it from a pure money-making standpoint yeah. and incentivizing it. I mean, one thing, I mean, they called Reagan the great communicator, but I would say that Trump is really the best at this, which is identifying in a way like social media, influencers, message spreading in a way that the other side just doesn't understand. I hate it. I hate it very much, but really, like if you look at what's happening with Trump and his messaging and Pelosi and her messaging, Pelosi's messaging is what's she gonna do next? Mm -hmm. What's she really thinking? Rather than putting a message out there that everybody understands. Right now, it's like, where are the articles of impeachment? And yeah. then she's like, I got you. I have no idea what she's doing right and now. And do they think that people are waiting with bated breath for this to come down? In the meantime, Trump has done six or seven ridiculously terrible things. Yeah. And, and they, they are slowly giving you new stuff, and this is, this is Obfuscating the the recent reveal that Trump directly through emails is the one who ordered the hold on Ukrainian aid. Yeah. But no, Trump's just throwing all that stuff out in the meantime. One of them is Eddie Gallagher. Mm -hmm. Eddie Gallagher saying, go kill Muslims, I literally don't care. Yeah, and if you do, you're gonna wanna be wearing the same clothing. So let's talk a little bit about how how unrepentant, how brazen this whole thing is. So you have this this picture here. Um, and let's let's go Salty to- Salty frog gear. Exactly, it's just- Friggin' like salty frogs. You, Do you, you know what happens to frogs thing. when you put salt on them? That's a good they point. literally disintegrate, you dumbass. So uh, it, the amazing thing is, it's not like there aren't other vet owned clothing companies. If you wanna buy clothing that's been designed and modeled by a vet, there's many options. Vets who have never been accused of war crimes, who have never been accused of purposefully shooting old men and little girls, who apparently weren't like, that was their thing. They're, they're talked about as if they were serial killers or sociopaths you know by their brothers in arms. You know who's a sociopath? The person who names it Salty Frog. Like when they mm -hmm. say that, so, that sociopaths start killing animals. Well, like this guy, I, 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 we have him posing yeah. with a dead person that he executed and then took a forbidden photograph with for reasons that I think any idiot can understand. They can understand, yes. But this dude, I think it's Salty Frog because he used to capture frogs. This is the only theory that I've been able to come up with, allegedly, allegedly, and put salt on them to watch them slowly disappear. Yeah. Don't buy those clothes, buy my clothes, incinerated cat. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so let's move forward. Uh, along with all sorts of items emblazoned with the logo, kill bad dudes, the site sells a waterboarding instructor shirt. Because the thing is, if you, against all reason, have gotten off of the war crimes you've been convicted of, what you should do is wear a shirt that brags that Why you commit you? other war crimes. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? That's a great point. There's no reason not to. You should embrace it. Otherwise, you are acknowledging that there yeah. was something wrong with it. I think a great thing to show support for our troops and a love of our God who is the creator is to brag about torturing people and encouraging other countries to do it to our soldiers when they're when they're captured, that's what you should do. Uh, he goes on to say on the site, brotherhood isn't just a statement, it's a way of life. This is coming from the guy whose brothers in arms said that he was a mass murderer. That he, he, he exposed them to enemy fire so that he would then be able to fire at the enemy. He didn't care if American soldiers died so he had a chance to gun people down. But you know, brotherhood isn't just a statement, it's a way of life. So is sociopathy, okay, yeah. that's a way of life too. Yeah, which means you can't understand brotherhood. And also evil is in quotes because someone, one of his brothers literally said this guy is evil. Yeah, there were Navy SEALs who broke down thinking about what they saw this guy do. They have been trained, they've been put through the best programming that's ever been done to get soldiers to turn them into killers. And even they could not believe what they saw this guy doing. Yeah, there should be some kind of honor there and there is no honor. Yeah. Happy half hour is streaming for yeah. members. Uh, I just want everyone to know that it is uh, gonna be on after main show on Friday. 
Um, today. And stream, today, uh, we have our big announcement of that, but you get it early, and mm-hmm. it's a best of. I kind of teased it last week, but it's happening, so you guys should absolutely see it. Happy half hour streaming live today at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you for joining us uh, on the show today. Uh, Brett, great to have you here. Great to be And um, we've got the main show coming up. The first hour is gonna be myself and Jen Uger, Anna Kasparian. Obviously, we're gonna be doing more on the incipient crisis with Iran. We have that for you a little bit later. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.